Oh, 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 wow. Having billions of dollars or being a billionaire is downright insane. And I'm gonna explain to you why. I'm not gonna get into the politics of it or capitalism and should that much wealth be in the hands of so few people and uh, economic inequality. Those are topics for a not science show. What I wanna get into is just how ludicrous it is to have billions of dollars. And I want to give you a few metrics that I hope get that across. So let us just take the net worth of the current richest person, I believe is still the richest person in the world, a Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com. I think that's the name of the website. He is worth, reportedly, as I googled, $108 billion. That's a lot. It's so much, and I want to prove to you, that it's hard to even conceive of that amount of money. So, for example, let's take a weird case. I saw this on Reddit on uh, They Really Did the Math, and uh, I, wa I double-checked it, and I want to present it to you in a little bit of a different way. So, a lot of people, well, I don't know if they do this anymore, but people used to, and some people still do, hide money under their mattress. How high would the mattress be stacked if Jeff Bezos <laughs> stored all of his money underneath his mattress? Well, let's assume that he is a king size mattress. Let's also assume that he is using $1 bills only to represent these 108 or not $108 billion because this would be the most bills and therefore it will give us the most fun answer. Next, a dollar bill is about six inches long and about two inches wide and less than a half a hundredth of an inch thick. Now. If we get the demand, let's assume that uh, Jeff Bezos sleeps on a king size bed. Hmm, there's a joke, there's a topical joke here that I don't need to make. Anyway, let's, ass <laughs> let's assume that he sleeps in a king size bed alone. So if he, <laughs> if he sleeps in a king size bed and you wanted to stack all of his money underneath that bed in the same rectangular shape in, and it took up that same uh, square footage, let's say, how high would the bed raise? It would uh, go up 30 kilometers from the ground. Again, as you can see, this is not to scale. This is the sun. This is the earth. This is the Kármán line, which represents our definition of space. It's about 100 kilometers up. This means that if Jeff Bezos tried to hide all of his money under his mattress, <laughs> you'd see something like this. Like a mattress stacked on money a third of the way to space. That is insane. And it gets even crazier. Obviously, uh, paper money is a lot thinner than it is uh, long so uh, or and wide. So if we just, let's say we try to hide all of his money under a mattress, but the, the stack of money was only a few bills thick, you know, something that could still be hidden under a mattress. Well, if we say, let's say that we only want to hide stacks of $1 bills underneath Jeff Bezos' bed, this is a weird show, that are just an inch uh, tall, then we get a bed that is uh, five square kilometers <laughs> in space. And then we get to astronomical numbers. Not, not only is that a big bed, but now we get to some really crazy numbers here. Because a dollar bill, a US dollar bill, is about six inches long, and we multiply that by 108 billion, if we laid every single one of Jeff's one dollar bills end to end, I bet you think I'm gonna say something about the circumference of the Earth. No, I'm gonna say if you laid all of his money end to end, it could encircle, this, this works, it's a sphere, it could encircle the entire circumference of the sun four times. All of Jeff Bezos' money could wrap around the sun like he was packaging it up in a money bow. That is ridiculous. If you started making $125,000 a day in year zero, today, as you are watching this live show right now, you would still be about $15 billion short of how, mu of how much money Jeff Bezos has. Being a billionaire is absolutely insane, just from the numbers alone. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live show. Oh, yeah, we're live, all off the top of my head. The live edition of this channel, where I try to take all of your nerdy comments, questions, and corrections, and comments about my hair and face and 
magic cards and rock climbing and stuff, and I try to answer it off the top of my head to the best of my ability to say something interesting and or entertaining at high speed because I've had a lot of caffeine today. <sighs> Look, I'm not a working scientist. I don't know everything. Uh, but I know a little bit about a lot of science and pop culture things. So if you have a question for me, wow, I've had a lot of coffee. You can put them in the YouTube chat wherever you're watching this, and if it's a good question and you're not spamming, then we might get to it, and Voice of the Void, Nate, is here to help me read those questions. What up, Nate? What up, Kyle? Woo! Don't know. It's a lot of moolah. It's a lot of cash. First question. I should say that a lot of, a lot of billionaires, a lot of bil some billionaires make bad news. That's fine. But uh, some billionaires like Bill Gates have, you know, pledged to give a lot of their money, if not the majority of their money away. Some do great philanthropic works. It's not always all bad. I just wanted to show the crazy, crazy Amazon numbers. I you could encircle the Amazon with a border of money, with Amazon's money. Crazy. I'm sorry, what? From Jessica Teague. Hello. If you could be transported to any of the Magic the Gathering planes, hmm. which one would you pick and why? I want to go to Ravnica because I like all the intrigue. That, that's it. All right. And I'd be Demir, and I'd be Lazav. I'd be Lazav Demir, Mastermind's right-hand boy. Uh, oh. Oh. From Java Mug. Sounds worse than I thought it was going to. If you were golfing and hit the ball so hard mm. that it went into the jet stream, what would happen to the ball, the club, and you? Okay, so this is a complicated question in that you're asking how hard would I have to hit a golf ball to get it up into the atmosphere high enough that it could enter um, this section of air. Let's just call it, well, it's a stream. <laughs> There's a stream of air. This is, again, not to scale, but a stream of air in Earth's atmosphere. Let's just say that it's right here that has a very... Uh, telltale uh, velocity. We call it the jet stream and it pushes weather systems around in a very predictable way. It's very fast air moving in a particular part of the Earth's atmosphere. How hard would you have to hit a golf ball to get it into the jet stream? I do not know where the jet stream starts. I do not know how high it is, but I'm guessing you're gonna have, you're gonna have to hit that golf ball really, really hard. I'm assuming that you'd hit it, you'd have to hit it hard enough to break it. And uh, for illustrations of things like this, you can look at uh, my buddy Destin over at Smarter Every Day, his video on hitting a golf ball at 500 miles an hour with a golf club. I imagine to get a ball into the atmosphere with sufficient height and velocity, uh, you would probably break the club and your arm if you are hitting it that hard. Next part of the question, what would happen to it once it's in the atmosphere with fast moving air? That depends very precisely on numbers that I, that I do not have, unfortunately, because if you have something like a golf ball, you need to know a couple of things to determine what its terminal velocity will be. And its terminal velocity is when the force of drag of the ball falling back down towards Earth as it's pulled towards Earth's basic center of mass here. It's when that equals its weight as it's being pulled down. It's, so this, when this balances, when this balances out, that's a golf ball. Now that's a golf ball. This will give you a terminal velocity. So you would want, in something like the jet stream, you would want the force of drag to be so high that the terminal velocity becomes zero. Not just such that the acceleration is zero. That's what happens when you hit terminal velocity. You're no longer accelerating downwards. But, but that the terminal velocity itself is zero. That means it is stationary. And if it's stationary, it could be floating. All that being said, this would require quite a bit of updrafts of air here to make sh to, to put <laughs> to counteract the weight of the ball. Is there enough wind speed in the jet stream, especially upwards, to support the weight of a golf ball once you hit it there after breaking your arms? I do not know. But this is how you go about doing it. What's next? From Smee Dyer 1. Yeah, I can answer that off the top of my head. I don't know, man. That's, that's, that's a TI-89 type of question. As a teacher who occasionally teaches science, what do you think is the most important rule for engagement in hmm. the lesson? Well, uh, well, first of all, thank you for being a teacher. We need teachers. Teachers are critically important to the future of everything, and you're probably underpaid and overworked, so I appreciate you. Uh, I, I was very fortunate in having fantastic teachers growing up, and I hope you are fantastic with your students and they love you. 
That being said, uh, I don't know. What I would love to do, and I was, if I had unlimited TV money, I would want to host a show where I was a substitute teacher. And I would love to substitute teach real classes around America. Anyway, but I've never actually taught a real class before. I got right out of school, right out of grad school, and started doing this kind of thing. So I've never taught. That being said, with my experience in doing this kind of thing, I think what some teachers and some communicators do not consider is speaking the language of those that they are trying uh, to um, educate. And I don't mean, you know, English or Spanish or a different language language. I mean, you need to get on the same kind of level, the interest level that the kids are interested in. So, you know, uh, a number of years ago, when, when did the Force Awakens come out, 2015 or whatever? You know, I was suggesting to, I was suggesting to teachers where, you know, there is a way that you can teach, you know, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, for example, you know, um, where, a squared, uh, c, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. But you could make it more applicable to, say, students in your class who had just seen The Force Awakens, you know, the biggest movie in the world at the time. If you wanted to give them the, their next example problem, maybe say, you know, oh, uh, BB-8 has traveled this amount of distance across the sand and, to, and for Finn and Ray to get to him, you know, how far, get to it, how far do they have to travel to meet him at the, at the correct position? You can implement things like the Pythagorean theorem, relative velocities, those kind of things. My point being is that too often I think um, teachers do not have either the, um, the experience or the ability, just because they're overworked, um, to model more classroom situations off things that the kids are really interested in and using topics that would actually grab their attention. There's a good story why uh, many of you watching are probably familiar with Randall Monroe of XKCD and he decided when he wanted to do his what if blog, which became a New York Times best-selling book, when he, when he substitute taught a class at MIT, a physics class, and his students were bored out of their mind until he started talking about how much Yoda could lift with the force. That's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to do with this kind of thing. I would say, you know, pay attention to your students. Listen to them. Uh, what are they interested in? What are they talking about? Try to apply syllabi and, and, and coursework to what they're actually interested in because once they can start applying real things, real scientific concepts and mathematical principles to their own lives, that's when it will really matter. I remember being in, what was it? It must have been a eighth grade. No, 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 no. 11th grade. And I remember a kid storming out of our math class saying, I'm never going to need to know any of this. It doesn't matter. And he left. And you, and you want to really try to minimize those situations. You want to apply these principles to their lives. Talk about, you know, how you could hit a golf ball into space, or if your kids are really interested in Fortnite, even it, no matter what you think of Fortnite. I mean, there are ways to get at the interest levels of people that I think can engage them in a way that just pure ivory tower kind of science won't. So listen to your students, really, really appreciate what they find interesting, and see if there are places or not where you can tweak accordingly. And hopefully they'll learn a little bit more. And if not, you're at least a fun teacher. From Matterbeam, OGMB. If Captain Falcon is burning up his gloves with each punch, we talked about this. Would he need new gloves each time, yeah. or could his gloves be actual heat shields? Yeah. So in the uh, Captain Falcon episode that uh, is now on the Because Science channel, which you can go watch if you want to, we are talking about Captain Falcon Falcon punching, and I considered his hand to be more of a heat shield, but. I considered in the calculations heating up the mass of pretty much the entire glove up to ignition point. So I think in what we were doing, it would have to be replaced every time, which would be really funny if it was like, Falcon Punch! Falcon Punch! You know, having to replace a glove each time. I think maybe your suggestion is, uh, is a smarter one where 
you can have, if you know your hand is going to be going that fast, perhaps you put on your hand some kind of ablative heat shield, a, a shield that could go in front of your fist that as it heated up, some material um, on the front of it would take in that heat energy, burn off and burn away and take that heat along with it. This is what ablative heat shields do if you want to uh, Wikipedia that. They take, they take heat away basically by destroying themselves under that heat. So if Captain Falcon's ablative fist was burning up a little bit as it traveled through, the glove might stay somewhat intact and you might see some kind of flame and then you get closer um, to a Falcon punch. But for those ca kind of calculations, that's a lot more complicated than our pay grade. We don't make circle the sun money. Bring it all back. From Spida18. They only have eight legs. What is your opinion? What in your opinion is the most imminent celestial threat Asteroid, gamma ray burst, solar cycle, moon leaving Earth's orbit? Um, solar cycle, no. We know that, okay. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna have to remember all this, and I might be off on some numbers. But uh, solar cycles, we know that the sun goes through different cycles, having you know uh, varying levels of sunspots and what have you, and cycles of activity that are you know every decade or so. I think it's every 11 or 12 years, there's a pretty particular predictable cycle. And the worst thing that might happen is, you know, something like I've drawn here, which is a CME or a coronal mass ejection where uh, materials, fl billions and billions of tons of materials flung towards the earth and it could fry all the electronics on earth and that'd be pretty bad. That's pretty likely in terms of likelihood scale. For asteroids and asteroid impacts, we have a pretty good appreciation of many of the um, potentially civilization killing asteroids near Earth or ones that might have pads that might take them close to Earth and we might be able to do something about it. And uh, random impacts like that that could end the world or like a dinosaur ending impact aren't all that likely in terms of like human lifetime scales, like tens of thousands of years. So that's pretty close. I'd say it's a little bit lower on the likelihood scale. Gamma ray burst, I would say, is next to the lowest. Even though if a gamma ray burst was perfectly, if a gamma ray burst was perfectly aligned with Earth and all the radiation hit us, game over, man. Game over. But gamma ray bursts, think of the likelihood. So if you have a star and the nearest star, remember, is parsecs away, and you're gonna have to look that up yourself. Parsecs away. And what that means is that you have a gamma ray burst that hits Earth. But the, because it is so far away, the change in the angle matters a lot. So it's so far away. So if you change, we'd have to do the math, but if you change this angle of where the gamma ray burst was actually firing, like this, like this you know, death laser from space, if you change it by probably just fractions of fractions of a degree, by the time those fractions quote unquote add up, and get all the way to Earth, it's going to miss. So that, and, and given how many, uh, given how big space is, the gamma ray burst thing would definitely mess us up, but it would be pretty low on the likelihood scale. So I'd say having all our satellites and electronics knocked out by the sun, probably likely, asteroids less likely, but still up there, gamma ray burst pretty low. What was the last one? Uh moon leaving our orbit. The moon is leaving our orbit very slowly. That time scale is a lot longer than, say, the sun cycle. So that's in between. So that's how I will rank them. And I, I, that, hey, whoa. Now you know what's going to end the world. And with that, thank you for watching this edition of Because Science Live. Woo! What a week. If you are going to Los Angeles Comic Con tomorrow, you can see me there. You can fist bump me. I am doing a panel. I forget the room, but it's called Our Sci-Fi Future. We have nine amazing panelists and writers on science fiction television shows like Star Trek Discovery and Altered Carbon. We have scientists. Uh, we have Jess Phoenix. Uh, we are talking at 5.30, from 5.30 p.m. to 7 at Los Angeles Comic Con. You can come see me there. Fist bump me. Don't touch me. You can fist bump me. It's a lot more hygienic. And next week, of course, new episode of Because Science, new live, new footnotes. Footnotes. Still kind of crazy. And the new episode has to do with the color that I'm wearing. Hmm. But until then, uh, stay safe, be well, and be nice to each other. Because this, because <sighs> if something like this happens, this is all we got.